Thank you so much for coming out to this exciting event. This is the second event in our Race Literacy series. We want to first acknowledge that we are on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people. We're grateful for this. We're also grateful for the possibility of this forum. I'd like to thank the UBC Equity and Inclusion Office for the Equity Enhancement Fund that I received. I also have other sponsors throughout the university the Center for Culture, Identity, and Education, uh, my department, the Department of Language and Literacy Education, the Jane Rule Endowment for the Study of Sexuality and Human Relationships, uh, gender, the Institute for Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice, and the English Department at UBC, and for our first event that we had, the English Department at SFU. So this is actually a very collaborative uh, event. These events are very collaborative. I don't want to take too much time, but I, I do want to just say that uh, people sometimes ask me why I called the series Race Literacies, and not because I'm in the literacy <laughs> Department of Language and Literacy Education, but thinking about literacy from a critical perspective, thinking about Reading, reading the word and reading the world, thinking about Donaldo Macedo who talks about education for stupid education, which is what education can be, but, it, but instead we want education for liberation. We want to change the conversation at UBC. Um, I've been here for five or six years, <coughs> and rarely do I hear any conversations about race. And I think people want to have these conversations, Furthermore, there's so much exciting research being done across this country by black Canadians, and I, I wanted to bring some, some, some people in, I can't bring everybody, um, but uh, we have a tradition, I think, in Canada of when we bring in black scholars, often they're from the US, when right in our <coughs> own country we have people doing interesting work. Um, so today's series is the second. On March 1st, in this very room at 2 p.m., Melinda Smith from the University of Alberta and David Austin from John Abbott College in uh, Quebec. They will be here. And then uh, we're still deciding on whether May or June, but for UBC scholars who are here, Denise De Silva, uh, Fanuel Antwi, Handel Wright, and myself will give a forum. Um, <clears throat> so keep post, keep, just keep. Keep up to date on Facebook, because if there are any changes, they'll be on Facebook. And those of you who like to live tweet, uh, the handle is Black Scholars CA. So let me introduce our guest to you. And uh, I was saying to somebody earlier this afternoon that I, I haven't read everything that Ronaldo Wolfhard has written, but uh, everything I come across, I read. And uh, sometimes I'll be doing a library search, and I'll see, oh, Tim something went over it, and I would just stop and at least <coughs> get the sense of it. He, he, he's very provocative, he speaks the unspeakable, and uh, he's cute. Ronaldo <laughs> 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 uh, Wolfert is an associate professor and director of women and gender studies at uh, the Women and Gender Studies Institute at the University of Toronto. He's also a member of the Department of Social Justice. <laughs> Department of Social Justice Education at Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, as well as the graduate program in Cinema Studies at the University of Toronto. In fact, last night, I another <coughs> gave a talk at uh, Selectors Records uh, here in Vancouver, and he gave a, a beautiful critique of the film, The Ninth Floor, about the riots, uh, the Sir George Williams riots. It was really marvelous. His teaching and research are in the area of black diaspora cultural studies and post-colonial studies, with an emphasis on questions of sexuality, gender, nation, citizenship, and multiculturalism. From 2002 to 2007, Ronaldo held the Canada Research Chair of Social Justice and Cultural Studies, where his research was funded by the Social Studies and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the Canadian Foundation for Innovation and the Ontario Innovation Trust. If you read his titles, they're very provocative. Some of you received the article called Shame. Um, Rude is another one. Rude. Um, I'm trying to 
kind of remember the rest of that. Uh, uh, Black Like Who, Writing Black Canada, um, he's also the author of the Contemporary Black Canadian Cultural Criticism. As well, he's the co-editor with Roy Moodley of Counseling Across and Beyond Cultures, exploring the work of Clement Rontrecht in clinical practice. Currently, he's working on or completing Black Diaspora Faggotry, Readings, Frames, Limits, which is under contract with Duke University Press. Additionally, he's co-editing with Dina Georges and Catherine McKittrick, No Language is Neutral, Essays on Leon mm -hmm. Brand, forthcoming, and he's completing The Long Emancipation, Moving Towards Black Freedom, an essay. As an interdisciplinary studies, black studies scholar, Rinaldo's published in a wide range of venues, magazines, books, journals. Um, every now and then you turn on CBC radio and Rinaldo is, is commenting on something. <laughs> so um, it's just such a pleasure to have him here. And um, I know you'll, you'll enjoy the time we have together. So without much ado, Rinaldo will come. in three parts, and I give it in memory of Andrew Loku, <coughs> who was murdered by Toronto Police July, Sunday the 5th, 2015, in the corridors of the apartment where he lived. Why don't we have a, why, do, why don't we have a Canadian Academy so white hashtag? On November 4th, 2015, PM Justin Trudeau announced what was quickly hailed as the most diverse Canadian cabinet ever. As quickly as the claim of most diverse was uttered, it was also criticized. When asked about his diverse cabinet and particularly its gender parity, PM Trudeau quit because it's 2015. On both social media and in the mainstream media, a debate about what constitutes diversity and furthermore representation emerged pointed to the limits of gender parity's diversity when race and ethnicity entered the frame. The debate delimited the phenotypic features of PM Trudeau's cabinet, pointed to indigenous women, South Asian, and Middle Eastern liberal Afghani MPs as a way to get beyond the limit of gender parity as diversity. 
glaring, glaringly absent from the phenotypic cohort with black NPs. It is at this point that we might find it important to note that the language of people of color, POC, and diversity is an obscuring language. By this I mean that logics of POC and diversity are, as is often used in the Canadian context, race, lack specificity, and therefore cannot do the work of anti-blackness, or the work to undo anti-blackness. The invocation of diversity is meant to suggest that the work of race, equity, is being done, and that representation is being worked for. But such assumptions can obscure exactly who's being included and represented, as is so clear with P.M. Trudeau's cabinet's composition. And as Leanne Simpson has recently commented as a critique, um, and she makes this point salingly clear in terms of the Aboriginal constitution of the cabinet that we must think about what it means to um, invoke indigeneity at the same time that anti-blackness is being expressed. In the Global Mail, Cecil Foster penned an op-ed, Canada's Blacks Still Waiting for Their Moment of Real Change, of the cabinet arguing that black Canadians had been left behind by the son and father of multiculturalism. Foster wrote, and I quote, but something is missing from this cabinet and from this reflection of, the Canadian, of Canada of 2015. There are no people that look like me, or my children, or my grandchildren, despite there being at least six liberal caucus members with Caribbean and African immigrant background. Once again, blacks and blackness are invisible. Foster's critique is more lament than a call for a refusal of diversity altogether, and it is executed faithfully to the doctrines of liberal multicultural ethos that will require us to believe that black representativity is possible. <clears throat> I take the opposite view, that black representativity is impossible to achieve in our current social, political, and cultural structure. It is nonetheless my view that Foster's article exemplify the paradox of black life in Canada, at once invisible and hypervisible. By this I mean the Foster takes an important representative space in the national newspaper, thereby confirming to some that blackness is indeed noted, but ironically to pen its invisibility. Whether we are speaking of crime, prisons, joblessness, education, and so on, blackness in Canada occupy a significantly, a significantly invisible role Usually one, of, usually one of the problem, and simultaneously an invisible role, that of a lack of specificity of what the conditions and measures of improvement might be. It is the latter that I, that I mark as institutional disregard. So that you know, when there's a problem, blackness looms heavily there. But when we come to the measures of amelioration, blackness disappears as, 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 as something that must be ameliorated um, dealt with, and so that's what I call institutional disregard. So we are in a strange kind of social, political, and cultural settlement in contemporary Canada, as far as black people are concerned. In this talk, I will not be able to address all the ways in which the word settlement is manifest, but I hope by turning to the site of the cultural as a broader frame for living black lives, that the weird state of Canadian blackness in this historical moment might be paid witness to. In this talk, I'm going to make some broad strokes make as many broad strokes as I can to point to very specific instances of the ways in which anti-blackness works in Canada. This talk will be situated somewhere between the academic and the polemic. Indeed, if any one single thing characterizes contemporary black life in Canada, it's the way in which black life seems not to matter at all, especially the nation's institutions. And I will focus today mostly on universities. But in any of the nation's major institutions, whether they're museums or galleries or government. Um, indeed, if there was ever a time in the recent past that making such a claim would have seemed as entirely cynical or even wrong, that time has now passed. Everywhere we look, black life is in dire straits in Canada. Whether we're looking at poverty, prisons, we're in the federal prisons, something between in the last decade, the half a decade, something between 69 and 80%. Of, of black and increased like, black people in, in prisons in Canada has occurred. Whether we're looking at children's aid societies in the province of Ontario, 41% <coughs> of children in care are black, all the 18 are black. Um, and in the city of Toronto, 31% of children in care are black or have, or have a black parent, one black parent. Um, you can see the same thing with the push out of kids in, in public school 
and so on. So, you know, the seriousness of uh, black life, the weather kind of poverty, prisons, joblessness, underemployment, unemployment, housing, education, and the list goes on. Black life is mostly stuck somewhere at the bottom of every marker along with indigenous people. What is particularly striking is that no level of government or any other major institution in this nation ever seems to find it necessary to speak directly to black people about their collective well-being. Some years ago in a conversation with one of Ontario's deans of education, our vice president, the dean was much excited by the ways in which the then recent report, The Ropes of Violence, authored in 2008 by Roy McMurtry and Alvin Curtin, investigating violence among youth, of which black and indigenous youth were a significant demographic. The commissioners had made mental health issues as they correctly should, a major aspect of their recommendations. What was interesting is that the said dean was very excited by the mental health issues, almost to the exclusion of other issues and recommendations raised by the report. This highlighting of mental health by the dean at the expense of other issues, of which a school of education should see itself playing a major role in, was indeed not surprising to me. The Roots of Violence report is also, was also critical of the ways in which public school education still silences black histories. And it was also critical of the ways in which black history remained absent from the broader Canadian, <coughs> nat Canadian national imaginary. All issues that the faculty of education could and should lead on. But instead, the dean was more interested in, interested, I suspect, in seasonal and mental health issues and the recommendation raised as a way to have access to what was then the sizable dollars of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. The then sizable grants from CIHR would obviously make anything swoon given the university's budgets. It's in such a fashion that I make the claim that the Canadian Academy, Canadian Academy is structurally anti-black and only interested in black women so far as it furnishes the agendas and priorities of those who are already there, that is, inside the structure, those who are marked as white. The dean could have imagined a range of ways to use the report's recommendations to bring more critical forms of diversity and a particular black scholarship to her faculty, but she could not go there. The overall Canadian Academy has failed similarly. Its inability to imagine blackness and black peoples beyond small compensatory acts is evident everywhere. What work are universities doing to bring forms of critical diversity to our workplace? What role are universities doing to provide space for non-white Canadians? especially the black ones that I train? How are those of us at the local levels of our faculties and departments creating the terms under which knowledges might enter, under which those, these knowledges might enter our institution, especially black knowledges? Interestingly, <coughs> I can answer my questions quite easily. Nothing is being done. And this is despite many good policies put in place and to activate such actions and outcomes. Over a decade ago, I served as permanent action director at York University. That position gave me critical insight into the ways in which Canadian academics work hard to keep things as they are. More recently, I serve as an advisor on, as I serve as an advisor on diversity and accessibility at OECUT. The experience was the same. The performative non-performativity of reproducing whiteness is skilled at writing policy and negligent at implementing it all the while making claims to being committed to doing otherwise. In the Canadian academic context, all of our claims of diversity, anti-racism, equity, social justice, are institutionally performative non-performativity in the service of the status quo. As a black studies scholar who ended the Canadian academic job market in 1995, the demographic constitution has not changed much over that 21 year period of my tenure. In short, it has been 21 years of the same view from my vantage point for black scholars in this country. In that time period, I have witnessed how contraband black knowledge have been smuggled into the university under the guise of race studies, ethnic studies, multicultural studies, <coughs> anti-racism, and so on. In each instance, the specificity of black life has disappeared as black scholars are asked to do more than black studies, as black studies is positioned as never sufficient unlike other kinds of studies. What is particularly daunting is that in areas like cultural studies, Canadian studies, women's studies, LGBT or queer studies, disability studies, um, areas that one might want to believe hold a, broad, hold a different and there are say more critical relationship to their institutionality. 
the same anti-black practices are at work. I'm going to suggest that ethically, the stakes are higher for these areas of study as an intellectual practice of politics, as Tor Hall names it, to begin to shift the overwhelmingly white Canadian academy to at least begin the task of resembling the demographics of the nation formation, especially in the urban areas where most of us live now. And here I'm thinking of particularly, I've got examples in my head, so let me get to question, we can talk about some of the examples. I'm thinking about you know, one of my students who works on diaspora, applies for about a job in, in global sociology. And the question was, well, what else can you teach besides blackness? Mm. <laughs> I suppose well, blackness is not always already global, right? So there's a certain kind of limit to how black studies is understood immediately. So I understand anti-blackness as a structure and a set of practices that are fundamentally conditioned to offer blackness no way in. These conditions are not always, and for the most part, explicit. Rather, it is a philosophical foundation that structures the inevitability of black eligibility. With such in mind, attempts to fix existing structures can only but result in failure, because the structure itself is built on logical practices meant to offer black with no space within. I'm influenced by the work of Frank B. Wilderson and Tamara Knopper, who also draws on Wilderson to point to the void of non-relation and that's Frank's term, that conditions others non-relation to black people. The black subject then has no relation to others in Western tradition, because those traditions from enlightenment onwards have been founded on the production of the black subject as a thing. Indeed, reckoning with anti-blackness, or as my friends and colleagues call it, Afro-pessimism, is such that one might walk away feeling that all forms of resistance are impossible and futile. The Afro-pessimism of black scholars and thinkers wants us to recognize that because the structures are fundamentally <laughs> launched against black people, that our forms of life, black forms of life, continue to shape what it might mean to be human in deeply profound ways. By this we mean the reckoning with the multiple violences of anti-blackness, black people is continually revive what being human means for all of us. I think the intention here is a quite vast silver winter s type project in which the word resistance is a lazy way to capture the vast dynamics at play. Afro-pessimism requires serious and significant intellectual labor to engage its insights, to engage its insights in the fullest because it requires us to question the last 500 plus years of human existence and seek its overthrow and destruction. And that blackness can often obscure a set of impenetrable structures that continue to produce black people as out of place, as things, and as not human. <coughs> Similarly, the term to POC as a common denominator for non-white peoples, what Jared Sexton has called people of color blindness in an article of the same name, is an obscuring gesture too. Sexton points out that people of color politics and its insistence on coalition often obscures the specificities of how anti-blackness shapes the experiences and realities of black people's lives. By so doing, people of color politics often assumes one size fits all in addressing, all size fits all in addressing issues of racism, especially in diversity policies of large institutions. Often in the policy context, when, when such occurs, it is others who benefit, and black folk do not because blacks are always structurally located differently in the institutions. The non-white inclusion is nonetheless taken as work being done to redress questions of racism for all who might be affected by it. Indeed, Sexton's intervention is quite evident in the Canadian academic scene, especially for our purposes. Sorry, in the Canadian academic scene, like that. The question of resources requires those of us doing labor on the delivery of black studies to do more than simply excellently critique um, the structure and to do more than simply become technocrats of the word. We find ourselves in the moment that requires us to articulate a politics for something. What might black studies or black Canadian studies be about? And I'm paraphrasing from Stuart Hall. Um, and in part from Stuart Hall and Bill Reddings are influencing what I'm going to say here. Um, what might black studies or black Canadian studies be about? if it cannot even impact the site of its own location, its own production. As Stuart Hall has reminded us repeatedly, any politics requires the symbolic drawing of the boundary. 
there has to be some symbol, I'm quoting from there has to be some symbolic divide. No politics is possible without a sense of an us and a them. I want to suggest then that the post-60s studies, and what I'm going to call the post-60s studies, the women's studies, LGBT, queer study, disability studies, now trans studies, black studies, and so on. Um, so I want to suggest then that post-60s studies in the Canadian Academy can begin to engage the symbolic drawing of the boundary through, for instance, at the local level. I'm going to talk to someone at the local levels in our department. Uh, I've worked at two Canadian universities. I've never been in a Canadian university that has said that they want to hire someone in black Canadian studies. And I wonder how many of you have been in such departments where that's been articulated. Um, that tells you something about the boundary keeping already inside the department. We tend to blame the administrators, but we ourselves got something to account for. So I, I, I want to suggest that these studies that should have a much more critical relationship to the university should be the first place that these particular moves began. Um, so my ideas on these questions, in particular the role of post-60 studies in the university is deeply influenced by Stuart Hall's essay, Cultural Studies and Theoretical Legacies, in which Hall makes a rather strong case for post-60 studies, which he, in that essay he uses cultural studies, but I'm going to use the term post-60 studies. Cultural studies being about something. Hall writes in that essay that cultural studies, quote, is a project that is always open to that which it doesn't yet know, to that which it can't yet name. And then Hall continues, it is a serious enterprise or project that is inscribed in what is sometimes called the political aspect of cultural studies. Not that there's one politics already inscribed in it, but there's something at stake in cultural studies in a way that I think and I hope is not exactly true of many other very important intellectual and critical practices. And he continues to stay, and I, and I, and I need to say this because the, the essay already does influence these states. So I don't believe knowledge is closed, but I do believe that politics is impossible with what I come to, have come to call the arbitrary closure. So this paper is all about the arbitrary closure of invoking black studies as a site where particular politics must happen right now in this moment in the Canadian Academy. Our inability to do so is to reproduce the deep philosophical foundations of anti-blackness. In particular, I'm interested in Hall's turn of phrase, an intellectual practice of politics. The turn of phrase asks, the turn of phrase asks that we, the practitioners and audiences of post-60 studies, do something. It does not prescribe what that something is, but it asks that when we identify what that something is, that we act in ways that reveals its potentialities, its possibilities for reshaping the world in more just ways. So I want to bring this notion of the intellectual practice of politics to its very local concern for us here in the university and the academy. And I want us to grapple with it. I want us to think about what that means for how we might remake, at least beginning in the, in the academy, the post-60s, um, post Canadian post-60 studies, women's studies programs, um, ethnic studies programs, and so on, um, as an intellectual practice of pol politics that might do something to overturn the ways in which anti-blackness works. Section two. <coughs> it is in the mid-60s movements of possible liberation that I direct, direct my engagement because it was the promise of those movements and their potential to produce a different config config configuration of planetary life that gave us the languages that we currently have and from which our political desires have now urgently, I would argue, require rescue. The languages of anti-colonial, of feminists, of gay and lesbian, liberation of civil rights and human rights, of indigeneity, and so on. And what I would call a siblings, disability studies, trans studies, asexuality, and so on, have come to mark the limit case of rethinking planetary life forms. This is to say that the collective struggle against systems of injustice that emerged in the 60s has unraveled into a series of often competing identities that mark the very limits of what was imagined in the 1960s, which was to move beyond those identity frames. These are two significant temp there are two significant temporal markers that hold the ideas of this talk together for me, post-World War II and post-1989. Is in part my argument that these two moments produce launches of life and potentialities or lack thereof that continue to shape and thus limit our imaginaries. Indeed, in all the case, in, indeed, in, in the ways in which I'm talking about the post 60s, listed above, 
They appeal to human rights and our civil rights have framed the logics of the post World War II studies and of post World War II studies and, and many of these studies actually whether tacitly or explicitly invoke the UN Declaration of Human Rights as the foundation of their claims to enter the, the normative institutions. Um, Similarly, one that understand the collapse of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the resultant unraveling of state communism as impeding radical movements imaginary to produce alternatives to capitalist organization of planetary life. Again, one might argue that the conditions produced by post-war rights discourses and practices and the interruption of our imaginaries in part induced by the fall of the wall have now become hegemonic conditions. In such a circumstance, the new liberal organization of life has rendered most politics reformist. Significantly, the press is still made with one characterized by rhetorics of inclusion and niche placement that most often does not fundamentally question the foundational arrangements that have produced the institutional and structural conditions of contemporary life. I would argue that, for instance, the ways in which many of our universities are now taken as a politics and record of work reconciliation is exactly that. Um, indeed, much of our politics in this moment remains stuck in either policing the borders of the mid-60s movements, so we're still policing what is a woman, what is a man, who is black, who is not, what is feminism, what is not feminism, or attempting to expand them to include what, you know, in other contexts we just call the additive model. This policing and expand is otherwise known as inclusion, and let me be clear, I am against inclusion. It's precisely the ongoing obsession with trying to get it right and the privilege of those movements as still useful for the modernist capital life that limits our potential to think life otherwise. Joanna Adolf Reed Jr. and his analysis of uh, post-desegregation de post black politics in the USA, we should understand such stagnation or boundary wars as a form of political demobilization. Reed writes, and Reed had this scheme where he has like these four prime dynamics of how incorporation and demobilization happen. I'm quoting from Reed, he writes, the regime of race relations management as realized through the four prime dynamic of incorporation that I have discussed has asserted a demobilizing effect on black politics precisely by virtue of its capacity for delivering benefits and perhaps more importantly for defining what benefits political action can legitimately be used to pursue. So what Reed argues is that the incorporation of uh, or what we've come to call inclusion of certain kinds of uh, political moments have led to political de demobilization in which people see that inclusion as a benefit, and that benefit then becomes the horizon that our politics attempts to reach. So our, uh, if, if, the, if the horizon is to simply be included in the university, that's not radical transformation. In my view, Reed's analysis works across all of the mid-60s movements, as those movements have all come to be incorporated into existence logics and structures of late modern capitalists, reaping benefits for few by reproducing the assumptive logic that such benefits are extendable to all. And that's the fundamental problem. They are not extendable to all. Significantly, when we look at such practices in their specificity, what we see most clearly is that the extension of benefits not only demobilizes more radical calls for transformation, but also simultaneously produces disposable populations in their way. My symbolic and actual inclusion in the academic community comes at the expense then of thousands of black people rendered in Edricola as a kind of logic for how the, this politics of self inclusion works. Such performative gestures, rather than structural destruction, are currently the means whereby late modern capital, as Bill Haver once put it, divorces its most cogent critics with not an apparent lack of indigestion. Those are, this, so, this is why I can stand up here in front of you and call up the university because the university can eat this up just like anything else. It doesn't matter. It is precisely for this reason that the value of inclusion in the many senses and ways that value might be invoked, especially in its monetary and racial logics, require a rigorous re-engagement. Indeed, my argument is premised on the idea that value is always already linked to capital and its racial economy, rather than ideas about human work, which I the human work which I believe have come to be the foundations of uh, anti-racism, social justice, equity, and its like. One might suggest that, that were those mid-60s movements and now study stalwarts in their inability to rethink and to put into place in their own movements and then beyond a different and sustainable idea of value. 
and understanding of value that could reside outside of late capitalist logic that was immune to the seductive, full of inclusion and performative rhetoric of representation of bodies, identities, and communities. The late Lyndon Barrett, writing with the contested theorizations of value, asserted that, quote, to interpose no alternative value in the theoretically neutral moment of calling value into question remains equivalent to strengthening and reincarnating reified dominant value. That the social movements of the mid 60s and their counterparts in the academy, now the studies, in their broadest sense did not rethink value, or only at its most radical extreme did they rethink it, meaning the Maoists and so on and so forth, means that the promise of a different order of planetary life was immediately compromised, and the conditions for incorporation made possible and therefore manageable in the already existing order and structure. So, women's studies, black studies, trans studies, they all entered the institution working with the same value of the institution. They all, when, when, when understood to be outside the institution, they have a different logic of value. When they enter the institution, they take up the same, the same logics of value within the institution becoming, um, even if still marginal, normative within the institution. The conditions, therefore, became adaptable to include the full substantive change. Again, as a pessimistic aside, let it be clear that the benefits won by these movements are nonetheless not meaningless. But rather, we must now come to see those benefits for what they are, <coughs> one at the expense of deepening an already deadly culture. In some ways, then, I am returning, to my returning in my arguments to a perverse kind of structural Marxist critique, which calls for revolution, but with some critical differences that I hope will be made clear by the end of this talk. The problem of reorienting value is an important one for any future that seeks to produce a world in which value exists between the orbit of the present financialization of all of human life. That's my critique of Canadian anti-racism, social justice, discourse, equity discourse, and its many offices, especially in our universities, is that they fundamentally operate from a belief in the sutured narrative of adequate potential and possible representativity in the institution. In other words, the foundation of its thought or ideas locked in a performative discourse of excellence and merit. The very terms, the very terms that makes the idea of anti-racism, social justice, equity, necessary in the first instance. While looking back at its historical invention and necessity, its implication would be somewhat different from the colonial, from the dominant discourse it adopts. The same terms, it adopts the same terms to be intelligible on the terms of the system it claims to want to unmake. Indeed, anti-racism, social justice, and equity as performative discourse functions to obscure rather than to specify. And here I return to Jared's text in the game. And I quote from Jared. We might finally name this refusal people of color blindness, a form of color blindness inherent to the concept of people of color to the precise extent that it misunderstands the specificity of anti-blackness and presumes or insists upon the monolithic character of victimization on the white supremacy, thinking the afterlife of slavery as a form of exploitation or colonization or a species of racial oppression, among others. It's precisely for the reasons that Sexton outlines that anti-racism and social justice as terms no longer make sense to me as venues for black liberation or any kind of liberation for that matter. Such terms obscure the varied and multiple conditions that have come to frame our livability in profoundly different ways. But importantly, such terms seem to suggest that justice can be had in a structure and system that is only possible as long as injustice is present given that it's founded in injustice. Therefore, therefore, I find myself asking, what work do, do, such, do such terms do? Who benefits from the performative dynamics of such terms? And the question that I, must come, that I must personally ask, how do such terms function to deny black life forms a planetary presence beyond the modern capitalism? Is it my stance at this moment that it's our, it's our responsibility to rethink the terms that now, in their faulty execution, produce the fictions of our collective politics. That's what I'm calling social justice, equity, diversity, and anti-racism, still too often relies upon the rhetoric of the institution and its structural apparatus as the basis of its critique, as though, as though the institution itself is power and not a performative representation of power at work. Such a critique means to suggest that the intended elements of social justice and anti-racism's address can at least be tacitly in line with a different a similar foundation for the social as we presently know it. 
At the opposite side of the same coin, the performative qualities of anti-racism and social justice become quickly complicit with stabilizing knowledge and thus commodifying it or being devoured by the institution and the, and the corporation, the multicultural corporation. Are you still with me? Am I yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the context of these claims, Bell Hooks is talking back, talking feminist thinking black, represents a singularly important contribution to many of us who came to age politically and often work in the 1980s. Hooks incites in talking back, her audacity to speak back not only to feminism, but to blackness as constitutively male, open up a critique, sorry, to white liberal feminism, <coughs> but to blackness also as constitutively male, open up a critique that allowed many of us to speak publicly to all kinds of concerns that we live as immediate states, but could neither find the courage or to utter or a politically engaged language to speak, even if we were brave enough. Black feminists and other feminists who call it, many of them lesbians, open up an entire terrain of knowledge claims and injunctions that act politically that help to signal a substantive change in patterns of knowledge production. And quite frankly, what could be asked and argued over? In short, they help to usher in the culture wars and to bring the crisis of knowledge to a boiling point in all the disciplines. Hook's essay on being black at Yale, education as a practice of freedom, remains for me an important manifesto about the North American Academy and the ethical responsibility to black studies and black scholars. She wrote concerning some black academics, and I want to quote that from her, um, because I think it's an important quote and it, it ties into something that I'm thinking about here. So she, she writes, black academics are not individually confronted daily with the horrendous acts of racist discrimination and exploitation that once served as constant <coughs> reminders that the struggle to end racist domination could not cease. That our lot remains intimately connected with the fate of all oppressed people, black people in the United States and globally. This has led many black scholars to become unmindful of the radical traditions established by black educators who are deeply committed to transforming society who were not concerned solely with individual progress or simply transforming facts about a particular discipline. What has places on the agenda is an ethical imperative to act beyond one's individual interest. And the reason I, I turn to this is because the reason I, I dedicate this talk to the memory of Andrew Loku is when Andrew Loku was, was murdered by the Toronto police in July of 2015, um, on the Monday morning there was um, a discussion uh, of his murder by the police on CBC Radio. And Dr. Kwame McKenzie, who is the C CEO of the Wesley Institute, which is a health institute, um, and also the director of um, underserved populations and health equality at CAMH, which is the, the, the major um, health and addiction outfit in, in Toronto and on, in Ontario. Um, this first response to the shooting was that police officers needed trauma care. <coughs> and um, he's a black scholar. But the police officers need trauma care. And I, I tweeted to the program to say that police should be disarmed. And Matt Galloway, who um, does that morning show, wrote back to me to say that the idea of disarming the police is a non-starter. What that's crucial to me is like the ways in which neoliberal management and organizational practice has limited our imaginations of what we think is acceptable, of what we think we can ask for, of what we think is achievable. And that's what I mean when I'm saying that, you know, the, uh, talking about this notion of the performative, non-performativity of these structures. Um, of, of turning to the very institution that we were once critiquing as the site for authorizing a certain kind of politics. And I offer this up as examples of you know, the, the, the problematic that we're engaging with. But similarly, you know, from the experience of being in the firm action office and so on, I've come across you know, um, what I would call the academy's pathological hatred of black women as something to behold. I don't make this claim to get some kind of feminist or womanist kudos. In my various positions over 20 to 21 years in the academy, I've witnessed how colleagues respond to black women's presence in the academy. 
In, my, in almost every instance that the black woman mentioned, there's an attempt to move on to something else, to delegitimate, or to just quite frankly ignore. This position can only be understood in light of the ways in which black women's, black women's feminist politics has re, 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 retained the most significant critique of state and institution of any contemporary feminist politics. I will repeat that question, I will repeat that sentence. This position can only be understood in light of the ways in which black women's feminist politics have retained the most significant critique of state and institution of any contemporary feminist politics. The insistence is one that consistently uncovers the ruses of diversity and inclusion as ongoing forms of state violence meant to incorporate a few at the expense of many. So how might the question of equality be reposed as a question or concern that distinguishes itself from what generally passes as anti-racism, social justice, and equity in the Canadian Academy? <coughs> I want to suggest that a broad-based engagement with questions of multicultural difference as incommensurable, as incommensurable with the foundational doctrine of the university is an essential element here. And here I'm drawing on Bill, Bill Haber's a very early work on this question. In this way, Equality is not reduced to merely numbers, even though we cannot discount numbers, and I do not want, and I do not intend to suggest that we do. But it's also about representative bodies and experiences. In this case, bodies always marked as colored or not one. Indeed, the struggle over equality becomes one wherein forms of knowledge being produced, disseminated, and, and actively engaged lead to a constitutively different university. Moving towards conclusion. In this regard, my argument that what we call black freedom is in distinct opposition to something called capitalism and the institutions thereof. So, given that the black body was indeed an instrument of capital, as i.e., slave, as well as a significant producer of it, that was both that is the black body was both commodity and labor. The question of freedom and capital is particularly not the one for black personhood. At the same time, given the intimate crossing of blackness and capitalism, can we call black freedom as an authentic possibility in order to raise a challenge to the imagination to produce new modes of living that might be in accord with some of the most radical global indigenous calls for a different kind of world, a world beyond reconciliation politics and its gestures. It is precisely in the moment that black personhood can be accorded its full human status that new indigenisms enter the world. I have, argue, I have argued elsewhere. If we take seriously that the problem is one of culture rather than nature or history or even economics, as Winter has argued, then the task before it becomes clearer. Winter states that we operate from, quote, a specifically culturally instituted order of consciousness, end quote. And she further argues that it is, quote, the phenomena of culture that provides the ground of all human ex existential reality or actuality. With such in mind, then, when took actually across a body of work has suggested that culture is the site of struggle and transformation, and that as a new culture can be instituted, because, because I'm a Winterian, it is, it is at this point that I part ways with actual pessimism. This, turn, this turns me to, or returns me to value. Friend Moulton has taken Marx to pass in terms of the relation between value, exchange value, and the commodity. In his reading of Marx, Moulton highlights that Marx could not imagine the commodity that shrieks. By that, Moulton places Frederick Douglass's F. Hester Supreme as embodying the, val the tension of value and commodity that, Marx that Marxist thought failed to grapple with. Indeed, this gap in Marx, which has been one that most black intellectuals have had to grapple with as they move with and through Marxism, and still hold it essential to some kind of collective possibility. <laughs> and Hester's shriek is indeed repeated in the contemporary moment as the inability to imagine the black woman in the academy. The invitation to enter these institutions, universities, police, psychi psychiatric institutions, um, even presidencies, as we say in the US, reveal the manner in which contemporary performative acts of inclusion reside in the longer history of a black slave life. Therefore, much like C.R.R. James, I want to suggest that making this case is not about what C.R.R. James called racial chauvinism, but rather about making clear the ways in which logics of degradation, humiliation, and oppression continue to work. As James points out, and I quote, 
any excessive sensitivities to black chauvinism by white revolutionaries, which would have been the spoke 60s politics and so on. It's a surest way to create hostilities and suspicion among black people, end quote. The same remains so today and prohibits our move towards a possible decolonial future. By this I mean the suspicion with which, for example, Black Lives Matter movement is greeted, but greeted only but confirms for many the unmovability of the deep structures of anti-black racism. Those that Afro-pessimists have argued must be entirely destroyed. Um, finally, what I have come to call in some of my other work a pure decolonial project, that's attempts to and on more is the silences that conditions our contemporary moment by risking identity in favor of a politics of thought. And by politics of thought, I mean to signal the ways in which coloniality's most profound operations work at the level of what it means to know and how knowing places somebody's out of place. Knowing and what it means to know produces the death word, bodily and otherwise, including envir the environmental disasters all around us, which began in the moment of colonization and racial slavery. These death words are both historical and urgently present, and through them we might, we might and can conceive of forms of relationality in which new modes of humanness might be possible. The demand here then is to think new possibilities for human life beyond capitalist modernity. In a post-communist world and a neoliberal globe, thinking, articulating, and moving towards different and new modes of human life is our present challenge as a pure decolonial project works to produce new modes of relational logics and conditions in which the intimacy of the European colonial expansion produced for us might be refashioned. But most importantly, a pure decolonial project arrests and subtends languages that promise to move us, that promise to move towards transformative relations of being, but instead are in collusion with that which we already have. As I have suggested before, the only accomplishment of neoliberalism has been its interruption of our imaginations. Thank you. <laughs>